we were all seated and this woman from the WAF arrived, this very um, high official. And she said, I've come to give you a lecture on your um, hygiene. So we all went, mm hmm And she said, now then, you know that you can, um, you can't have a bath because you lose too much water, but you can use, wash your, you must, there are three important parts of you, you must wash. Your face, your feet, and your fork. Your face, your fork, and your feet. And I went, and then she said, and you can do, and I said, but I can't wash those without a bath. She said, you can use a mug of water. I said, I can't get my bum in a mug. So she, she was sort of very cross at me, and she said, you stupid girl, you just use enough, what I'm saying is you use a mug full of water in the wash basin, and then you wash, first of all, your face, your fork, and your feet. I didn't think we knew what a fork was, really, then. Anyway, going to next morning to my work, we were marching across the square, and all the, there was a lot of whistling. The airmen all shouted that. Washed your cutlery this morning, then, darling? The WAFs had a certain glamour, owing to their association with pilots. Some women were themselves trained as pilots, not for combat, but to deliver planes from the factories to the airfields. However, most women joined the Auxiliary Territorial Service, where they were trained to do almost everything that didn't actually involve fighting, from cooking and cleaning to operating anti-aircraft guns, although they weren't actually allowed to fire them. The Wrens were seen as the elite, and most women thought that they had the best uniform. But while some women chose which organisation to join according to the uniform, others just made do with the kit they were given. In those days, at the beginning of the war, it was a, a not a very nice um, uniform to wear. I think it was fairly smart to, to look at, except for those dreadful hats. I was very proud of my uniform. I liked to look smart. I could beat any man at being smart, and a lot of us were like that. We were very, uh, very upright. The women had to get used to wearing uniforms. The men had to get used to working with women. Anne Hill, initially the only woman on her naval base, was still in civilian clothes, and the men weren't quite sure how to treat her. They were very polite and opened doors for me and, and made sure that uh, I had a comfortable chair to sit on <laughs> and really looked after me. Uh, I was thoroughly pampered and, and uh, thought this service life was something that really was very, <laughs> very pleasant. And if ever there was an air raid, they would come in and give me a tot of rum, which was unacceptable. And um, we also had our <coughs> ration of um, uh, tobacco, which did surprise me somewhat uh, when the rating came along and asked whether I wanted my ration in pipe or cigarette. Uh, I didn't smoke, but my father, who was uh, uh, nearby, um, smoked a pipe. So I had my ration in pipe tobacco. <laughs> that didn't last very long. The tots of rum didn't last very long either. Directly they started um, recruiting other wrens. Then of course we were very much more disciplined. And um, once we got our uniform, well once I got my uniform, of course, I ceased to look like a civilian and therefore was treated as a service person rather than as a civilian. Some of the men at Josie Rule's air base felt threatened when women started doing traditionally male jobs. As a mechanic, they, I think they were a little bit hesitant about 
having us um, do any work. I, I think they thought we wouldn't be able to do it up to their standard, but there was no, uh, no sort of not helping you, because if they didn't help you or you didn't help them, something would go wrong. Well, you know, that there were consequences to it. Women were leaving their homes, family and friends and working alongside men on military bases. In wartime, with the spectre of death at their shoulders, people tended to live for the moment and men and women struck up friendships faster than they had in peacetime. Those people who were off duty and wanted to would um, just go into the Norfolk Hotel and the pilots who were off duty or had already made friends with um, WAFs or civilian ladies, um, it would be uh, just a jolly mad evening and then you'd separate, go on your merry way and the next time there might be different pilots there. So you, you got to know a lot of pilots, they got to know a lot of girls. Anne Lowe was stepping out with the pilot, a man she'd known since childhood. His hand was on my knee and I said, now stop that, you've got to stop that. And he said, oh, he said, Anne, we've known each other since we were children, can't we, you know, sort of make love. I said, no, no, not on any condition, we cannot do that. He said, but, uh, you know, I said, I said, and anyway, Michael, we're Catholics. Oh, he said, back up being Catholics. And I said, anyway, what a risk we're taking, you know. And he said, I'll never forget it. He said, I risk my life for you every day and you won't take one little risk from me. And he was killed the next day. It was always very sad if um, a Spitfire or, or pilot didn't come home and not a word would be said, but an upturned, upturned wine glass would be put on the mantelpiece and you didn't ask who it was. Um, you could tell it may be the friend of somebody because he'd be a bit doleful or he'd get horrendously drunk. The horrors of war were never far from people's minds. By February 1941, everyone on the home front knew someone who had died in the war, whether at sea, in the air, or in the desert. And in North Africa, Allied fortunes were about to take a turn for the worse. 